Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. It's Phil, John, and Logan here today for episode number 154. On today's episode, we're going to talk about what is woodworking season, spring routines, and some shop updates and project updates going along here. Hope you enjoy the conversation with today's show. Don't forget to stick around for a free plan that we'll talk about at the end of the show as well. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Tightbond. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. All right. To get things started, in woodworking publishing land, there is a well-established woodworking season. Mm -hmm. And by that, we mean from about late August to right around this time, mid-May, we have more people respond to emails, our direct mail campaigns do better, more sales for products and whatever th through various promotions and that kind of stuff. So we call that woodworking season. And you'll see it in other brands too, where they'll have like back to the shop kind of around back to school time. And I totally get that. Um, the question that I have for you and the listeners is, does that really reflect woodworking season or does that more reflect the time when woodworkers have the opportunity to respond to that kind of thing? Because right. like I'm an enthusiastic woodworker and summertime is usually prime time for woodworking for me because I can be out in my garage shop without freezing to death. And it's fun to be out and have the doors open and, windows open and hear all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sweaty. I feel like I, I'm the same way. It's like, I don't start picking up woodwork, like free time woodworking until April, May when it starts to warm up. And then, and I don't know if it's cause I have a wife that's a teacher and kids in school. So it's like always busy time during the school year. And then summertime is less busy or, and the weather's nice. So I get to be out in the garage and, but I don't know, like, that's just because we're Midwest and, you know, some people are oh, in the South fair. and it's getting too hot to be out, out in their garage. So they work more during the fall and springtime or, or what yeah. the, what the, what the situation is and how it differs from, from what we have here. But isn't that like their, t their winter time? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like don't right. the season switch. <laughs> you know, when you get South of the Mason Dixon line, yeah. It yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, south of Missouri, right? Um, I think I think it's probably. I would. I don't know. I just thinking about all the the people I know that would work as a hobby, not not us. I I kind of exclude us from that. Most of them are busy doing crap during the summer. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of them have big gardens. A lot of them, you know, are are fishing. You know, they're. They're doing other things rather right. than woodworking. Once you hit that fall winter, I mean, yeah, they might have some winter hobbies like ice fishing and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's like that's not um, you're not going to go every day, it's, right? I'm an I I'm a fisherman. Ice fishing is a little more miserable than summer mm -hmm. fishing. Um, so I I don't know. I I definitely think there is a season to it. Um. I think there are those of us, like you, you guys said and show that, you know, year round is is woodworking season, and I think that's probably mainly those that are, you know, working in the shop. Um, that's in, in a garage. You know, that's not heated, not cooled. You know, it's it's one of those. You, let's just call you guys fair weather woodworkers. <laughs> yeah, I'll get it. I'm soft. <laughs> you look like you can take a punch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank I, you. Uh, That's the nicest used, thing anybody said to me today. <laughs> I've done a bunch of woodworking when it's cold, especially like when it gets to be uh, 
like prior to Christmas coming up, you know, and you got gifts to finish and I'm out in my shop and I've been out there doing stuff like that, but it's not, it's not as inviting. Like I have to get myself up to go Mm -hmm. out to the shop when it's like that. And I guess that's true. It probably is a Midwest thing, or maybe it depends on where your workshop is located. You know, that it's, you know, if I had a basement shop, would it be easier to be in there year round or in the quote unquote woodworking season? Although I wonder like what you were saying though, Logan, maybe uh, the summertime is like general activity time for people mm-hmm. more likely. So they're probably still woodworking, but also gardening and also, you know, doing stuff outside or traveling or stuff like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, no, so I, then I, you're just not, I'm not yeah. reading magazines because I've stored up what I'm going to be doing for the summer and it's this kind of stuff and you're just locked in. Yeah. Now, and, and I think one thing to be clear about when we're, when we are measuring woodworking season, you know, we're, we're measuring it based on the stuff that we, we produce. So right. our magazine subscriptions, our sales of plans, our, our tool sales, that type of thing. And just thinking about like the spring into summer season, that's when a lot of other expenses kind of hit like, Oh, Hey, it's time to plant the, the garden. So you're, you're doing landscaping work. You know what I mean? Like you, right. you may be buying, you know, a new boat or I, I don't know, you know, there's, there's a lot of those type of expenses that pop up that maybe necessarily don't come to fruition during the, the fall and winter. Um, you yeah. know, if, if, People like to go to baseball games. You know those those happen during mm-hmm. the summer, or your your grandkids have baseball games, so you're doing that two nights a week, mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. Yeah, so. yeah. That was the other thing I was kind of thinking. I mentioned that like my free time is the summer because I have you know school age kids that are in a lot more activities during the school year, but a lot of our consumers are a different different demographic where they're re- probably more retired. So right. they have the grandkids during yeah. the summer. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Ship them off to the grandparents, and then Fair. And now, yeah. now I have free time. Right. right. Uh-huh. So that's my question for the people that are listening. Then, if every day is Saturday for you, is there a woodworking <laughs> season? So, right. for the retired folk out there, let me know in the comments section or email, because I'd like to find out like what's the truth behind woodworking season. And I'm I'm totally fine with it being. But it would just be interesting to know, just because I know from my own experience and, you know, we three see each other quite frequently. So we know that, you know, like I know that John's in his shop more in the when it's nicer out because it's nicer out. You mm-hmm. know, I guess what got me thinking to it, thinking about it is last few nights. It's been consistently in the 60s here in the evening so after dinner i can go out to my workshop have the garage door open and i've been in like maintenance mode taking some of my outdoor furniture and sanding it down where needed and putting on a new coat of finish and that kind of stuff and uh it's just been kind of a delight to have that experience whereas previous shop experiences have been like turn on the heater go back inside, wait for it to warm up a little bit Mm. and then try and figure out what you can do before you freeze to death. You know? Yeah. That's, it's funny because I've been like the opposite because right now the shops all like buttoned up. I have T T one eleven on the walls, like covering the windows. So I can't open windows. I got one door, (laughs) but it bakes in the sun. It's been sticky in the evenings out there. Like I go out there and in, three minutes. Maybe it's just because I'm in winter mode still. Like, I'm not used to the right. sweating yet. Still got your winter but, coat on? Oh, man. I go out there and I'm drenched in, like, three minutes. Like, I was doing stupid, simple stuff. Like, you know, cutting out my door between the storage area and the shop, you know, with a jigsaw. Sure. And I'm just so drenched. And then all the jigsaw dust is just sticking to me everywhere. <laughs> and it's like the crappy CDX plywood dust. It's, oh, mm-hmm. yuck. So... Self flocking, I think, is what that's called. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> but all right. So speaking of your shop, like, how close are we? What are we? What's the next step? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <It's> just... 
I think I started this entire thing saying that I wanted to be done and moving stuff in the end of April. Crap has happened um, that has not... I mean, there has certainly been days where it's like, okay, I'm just too sore. Like, I've been, I've been fighting really bad golfer's elbow and stuff. So, like, there's days I'm, sure. I'm just taking off because I don't want to, you know, ruin my body doing it. But, I mean, there's been things that have not been planned that have happened that have slowed me down. Like, my wife traveling over the last month and the next month um, really cuts down how much I can work on in the evenings. Because I'm, you know, trying to... These little children want to be fed all the time, which is odd. Um, mm-hmm. So, I have all the interior hung except for the office and the bathroom i need to hang those with drywall so i did t111 on everything which is carport siding i guess if people don't know what t111 is it's carport siding yeah um i need to do drywall and mud and tape sand that and then i'm ready for paint okay so so in reality i got drywall work in two rooms i have painting and then I have to do a little bit of video work. I got to do some video work on mini split installation. Sure. Kind of like shop HVAC type stuff. Um, the epoxy floor. I think I want to wait to do that until after the mini splits. Cause I think we want the drier air versus the, the hotter humid air for the curing the epoxy. I don't know. Well, that especially it with that fluctuations much. in humidity, yeah. I think could make a big difference. Yeah. So, I think my order of operations is going to be drywall, paint, mini splits, then epoxy floor. Um, now, I'm kind of in a little bit of a bind. Um, my buddy Bobby, who I know listens to this podcast, may save my butt on this. I cut a bunch of white pine um, so uh, because I saved a couple logs from a tornado, you know, whatever. Uh, I cut them into one by sixes. Think I'm gonna use them for like shiplap type oh, or yeah, like yeah. maybe like a not a bead board but you know like something around the lower three feet because I only did the T111 from the ceiling down to about three feet 42 inches from the floor. I was like, you know what I should really do? Hindsight, I should count how many pieces of that one by six I have and make sure I can reach the whole way because I need 160 <laughs> linear feet of it, three feet tall. So. That's like, what would that be? 320, uh, 580 board feet of it basically is what I need. Um, I don't have enough. I have enough to get halfway. Okay. Mm-hmm. Almost done. So, yep, almost there. So I texted him. Him. Well, and I mean, that is a possibility, <laughs> like quite yeah. honestly, because I, I did, I made it one inch thick. I could resaw it down to three eighths probably mm-hmm. and make probably. it work. Yeah. That's a lot of resawing. And after seeing yeah. Phil resaw the little bit of pine he resawed and knowing how much sap was on the blade, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, maybe this isn't the best idea. I think Mark might kill me. Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> I did text my buddy Bobby and I was like, Bobby, have you, you got all your trim done yet? Because I'm hoping maybe you have some leftover pine. <laughs> and he's like, I got you. I got you, boo. So, so he might save me with a little bit of pine, extra pine. We'll see. Um, my other option would be do like some sheet good type stuff on the bottom, but I feel yeah. like sheet good, sheet good beadboard looks like sheet good beadboard. Right. Yeah. And I don't really want that because I was kind of hoping to stain the pine like a alder or a cherry color. So we'll see. There's a couple unknowns. What I'm saying is that once that epoxy floor is down, I'm moving stuff in. I don't care if that lower half the wall is done. <laughs> it will be what it will be. Stuff around. There you go. Yep. 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 Um, I, I guess I do have all the outlets. Um, I don't have any of the outlets done in that area. Um, each wall is its own circuit. So I think once I start moving stuff in and everything's conditioned and whatever, I'm not sweating my fat butt off in there. I think I'll say, all right. One day I'm going to do the north wall. One day I'm going to do the west wall. One day I'm going to do the east wall, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and just kind of get them set up like that. Yeah. Um, but I guess I don't really want to do the electrical until I get that lower wall finished, so I can install the outlets and 
cover plates. So I don't know. My end of April time frame is hoping to be end of June time frame now. Okay. <laughs> so just being realistic with myself. Uh, you know, it's one of those things like I'll get it done when I get it done, I guess. Yeah. I did get concrete poured since John actually came out and saw my shop last week. We were doing some filming here. I got my concrete poured around my porch, which was nice to get done. Um, so now I'm not walking on gravel to get inside. It feels a little more finished on the outside, and now I can actually get some dirt in and grading work to, to make my area stop looking like a construction zone. It will still be a construction <laughs> zone. But from the outside, I'm not saying that's where John got a screw and a nail. No. Yeah. But if he said, hey, <laughs> if he said, hey, this was yeah. this was a six millimeter hex head sheet metal screw that's painted blue. I'd be like, mm, maybe that came from my house. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I did tell right. Phil over the last week as I was driving, I could hear with the window down, I could hear uh, like a click, tick, like tick. like yep. something that paced with the tire rotation. So it's yep. like, mm, I don't think there's anything in the tire, but then noticed uh, the tires getting low last night. So. Yep. I'm just going to put like uh, a, a row of magnets all along the, the base of my minivan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'll pick up all the hardware. Yeah. That's a that's a tip. Yep. Yeah. Get some of the Harbor Freight yeah. toolbar magnets and that's just right. screw them right just to the side of the car. Just hang them in from chains like just in front of your front wheels. There you go. See, what yep. you wouldn't even need a screw. See what you just stick them on, right? The yeah. And then at the on. end. Then at the end of the day, you know, you just scrape off what's there and you take it to recycling. And it's like you're making money just you're driving making around. Money. Yeah. So. And then you put that with your Grubhub side hustle. <laughs> and this is why none of us are rich. Yeah. <laughs> These are terrible ideas. Yeah. Now, if you only could get like an aluminum magnet to be able to get cans from the side of the road, Ooh. too. Batwing magnets, like a mower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, on a semi-related note, I was working from home last couple of days, and I saw what looked like, I thought, just from like a trade work van drive up our street. Just kind of a standard-looking van, except that it had like a bracket thing on the back of it with two boxes. So I thought it was just like an extended whatever, so they could put ladders on top or whatever, and it... But it didn't, there were no ladders on it. And I was like, what in the world is that? That just seemed bizarre. And then later I was coming into town, past that same van at a different intersection. And it was, uh, I think it was like a company, plates were from like Arkansas or something. And it was automated road surface and condition scanning. So it's just driving up and down all the streets, and it scans the road for what the what the roadway's like. Good. So then they'll know where the potholes are, so they can purposefully not fill them. Yep. <laughs> Avoid <laughs> <Right>. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were on uh, time I saw them. They were on seventy third, going through the People's Republic of Windsor Heights, and mm -hmm. it was that road looks like somebody drove through it with a plow. It's not. It's not a fun ride. No. I thought you were going to say it was like some form of like, because I know Wilton makes like their hitch vices and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. I was thinking you were gonna say it was like some like hitch mounted drill press and something else. <laughs> like that's PTO or powered <laughs> drill press. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could see that. Yep. So anyway. We're just about ready to wrap up another TV show episode, and we're building the shop station. I think it was called in the issue that you designed, John. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of fun to see it. Like, the guys in the shop, Mark and Steve, when they build stuff, like, I check in on them every day usually. But to see it getting built live is a totally different thing, especially when it's Chris Fitch. Because... Mm -hmm. He got that lower unit together, and it was just kind of interesting how things work for Chris Fitch in a way that they don't for me. Mm -hmm. You feel like you almost need like Morgan Freeman narrating Chris Fitch working, <laughs> like, yeah. it's a, like it's a Nat Geo documentary. 
Like, yeah. <laughs> it would be fantastic. I wonder yeah. if we get an AI voiceover to do that. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, because even when Chris screws up, like, admits to screwing up, it works out for him. Like, yeah. he screws up better. <laughs> like, you know? Like, that's Happy actually little accidents. Yeah. Yeah. He fails up. So. <laughs> So anyway, it just reminded me like how cool that project is mm -hmm. for organizing a shop. And if I didn't have things set up the way that I currently have them in my shop, I would build one of these for for my space just because of how nice it is. So, yeah. So stay tuned for that episode coming out later this fall. That'll yeah. be a fun you, one. You know what I appreciate about that? And I don't say this about all of John's designs. Most of them, though, like... Like, I would say, I would, yeah, John's a top three designer. Uh, for sure, yeah. for sure. Top five, for sure, <laughs> here, anyways. Uh, but what I what I appreciate about that is it actually has some decent, like, power tool storage that doesn't look like it's the standard stupid slotted file. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Um, because I feel like even, like, the charging stations we've done are always like, eh, it's a yeah. charging station. You know? And it looks like a charging station. Yeah, and this actually is like, okay, this is a little bit better. I can put all my charging stuff on here, but there's other things about it. So, Yeah. yeah. I think what I, I mean, not to keep Pat and John on the back here, but I'm going to, is back when I was getting started into woodworking or, you know, learning it from my dad and watching New Yankee Workshop, there was an episode where Norm built like this back bench hutch, storage hutch for his mm -hmm. stuff. And I just liked the simple practicality of that project. It's got a fun, it's shop, it's a shop project, but he kind of had a furniture look to it in that it wasn't just, you know, random you know, shelf standards bolted to the wall and leftover pieces of one by just kind of slapped on top or whatever. It, there's a cabinet look to it. The only thing is, is like, you know, he did it for that studio and that space and it's humongous. Mm -hmm. So if you go back on YouTube and see it, it's just a big, big unit. So I think what I like about John's is that it's got that same kind of, thoughtfulness and care in it like you were saying logan that a lot of power tool storage like and we're guilty of it you know we build oh, a yeah. fine tool we would build a, a a tool cabinet and we trick it out with hand tools and stuff that most people aren't using and then it's like what do you do with your power tools i just throw them in a box you know or a yep. rubbermaid tote and maybe the lid gets put back on or maybe it doesn't but this is like i don't know you treat your power tools the same way you know mm -hmm. yeah and it's customizable too i just like that you know you can take yeah. little elements and repeat them or omit them however you need to be able to get get the get the project where you want it mm -hmm. so let's see i'm also wrapping up a desk project for video which I think is pretty cool, that Mario Rodriguez one. Mm -hmm. And having built that and gone all the way through it and got it where, because it's a separate case, and then the base is a, like a standalone, like a stand, for lack of a better word. And I was finally able to put those two together last week. And the like evil genius of Mario's design just comes alive in that because... Mm -hmm getting it up there it's like oh that's a sweet looking piece and works really well too i think so it'll be fun to have finish on that so do you guys when you guys are building projects i feel like i i feel like phil just did this as he glanced over at it when you guys build projects, do you sometimes look at them and go, oh, yeah, that looks good? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, do you? Because yes, I, I have built stuff where I'm like, eh, it's yeah. going to work. And then right. there's some projects where I'm like, girl, you look good. 
you know, like depends on what <laughs> looking it is. healthy. Yeah, you look at <laughs> healthy. Like I mean, like like not that you're surprised about how it came out, but you're like, yeah, this worked exactly how I was hoping it would. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely. I've had projects that were ugly wins. You know, <laughs> like it was still successful, but just barely, and sort of in spite of myself. Yeah. Where, yeah, and then this one, like that desk or the trunk that I'm working on, mm-hmm. you know, there are things about that trunk that I feel like could have been different, or I would maybe do take a different approach to it next time, you know, mm-hmm. if I were to build a different, a, a copy of it, but in total, it matched what I wanted to do accomplish with it. So that, that part's kind of cool. Yeah. 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 I get that feeling more when I design the project and then let Steve or Mark build it. And it's like, <laughs> dang, we did a good job. <laughs> good job us. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah. I mean, cause there's some projects where I don't know how you guys feel about it, but there are some aspects of woodworking that I feel I kind of have down. Like I don't mm-hmm. have to worry about, you know, these three tasks of this project, but there's this one that I'm not quite sure of. And my, skill and coordination level isn't where I think it should be. And like, I can get it done and you muddle through. Mm -hmm. And then there's other projects where like, you know, all nine realms line up and, and you're there. So. Yeah. I call those woodworking speed bumps. Cause it's like, yeah, you're cruising (laughs) along with all the things, you know, and then you kind of see that coming, you slow down and like, (laughs) am I going to make it and just kind of go over that bump and hope you didn't bottom out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny because I kind of, I mean, I do the same thing with like, with turning. I mean, turning is one of those things where I like, I'm, I'm overly critical of my own stuff when I turn like more so than I'm with my woodworking because it's like, I feel like I am not that I'm more engaged with turning, but I feel more critical of myself because it's either right or it's wrong. Whereas okay. with a project, it's like, well, okay. I mean, yeah, you could have done it that way. You could have done it that way. Um, I don't know. I, I guess I haven't had in a long time. I haven't had that like, looking at a wood turning project going dang that looks good <laughs> like i don't know i just haven't done that lately it kind of makes yeah. me sad now that i think about it but like okay is that because my expectation of myself's becoming more and more mm-hmm. maybe could be I, I, I guess i do it more with wood than i do with <laughs> the actual turning like yeah dang that's a good looking piece of soft maple yeah <laughs> like i do that but it might be because like woodworking is more straightforward and you know ahead of time the that's true. the target you're going for, whereas turning is kind of an art form and that's you took fair. off too yeah, much, there's no fair. going back and it's just like, oh, that's not really what I was shooting for, maybe. You can't make I a didn't new know piece. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean so. like I mean, you can make a new piece, but you're starting over. Like right. whether it's like, oh, well, you know what, I don't like how thick that rail ended up being. I can trim it down or I can make one that's thicker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's fair. Today's podcast is brought to you by Tightbond. You want a glue that you can trust. And fortunately, Tightbond has the glue you need to get the job done with confidence. From interior glues with strong initial tack and short clamp time to exterior glues with exceptional strength and water resistance, look to Tightbond, the right glue for your next project. For more information, visit tightbond.com. So, okay, this is kind of, this is out of left field. <laughs> But we give a lot, not we, I'm not going to group John and I with this. Phil gives a lot of hate to the Intarja crowd. Right? <laughs> yeah. I'm more tolerant, I guess. I right. am too. I'm, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm more inclusive <laughs> than yeah. that. Uh, there's another part of woodworking that I, I want to say this, and I know I'm, some people are going to be like, yeah, you butthead. I feel like scroll saw works one of the same things. 
as intarsia work, right? Like the scroll saws. The scroll sawers. The scroll sawyers. 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 Scroll sawyers. Yes. Sure. Because, and I only say this, so I bought a, a third lathe, okay? Um, it, and I bought it just to flip it. It was, a, it was like a price I could not turn down. Um, so, and it's a little one. It's a, it's a little Delta. It's an older one. It actually was, it was given to this guy for a magazine review. Um, this guy is local here in Des Moines. Um, him and I started chatting a little bit. Uh, his name's Rick and come and find out he had written a lot of stuff for wood magazine had written. He said he had written some things for Woodsmith. I don't know that Woodsmith ever had contributing writers in the past. Um, but I don't know. Anyways, yeah, he had taught he had taught a lot of the scroll saw stuff out at the store as well. Um, sure. So he was telling me he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, I'm I was really big into scroll sawing. I mean, he, I mean, he's an older, you know, he's an older gentleman now, but back, you know, in the early 2000s and 90s, he was in a lot of magazine work. Um, had a couple of lathes, and he was. I, I noticed first thing I noticed when I walked into his like garage type shop was a lot of like laser cut like scroll saw type stuff. I was like, wow, you do a lot of laser work. So he showed me his laser and stuff. Um, it was all like really delicate type scroll work. He's like, yeah. He's like, I used to do this all with the scroll saw. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, I wrote for magazines for years doing this. I was like, okay, that's cool. And then I kind of noticed that there was like four or five like nice scroll saws around his shop. He's like, yeah. You want to see upstairs? He's like, I got two hundred scroll saws upstairs. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you're full of crap. But yes, I want to see it. He was not full of crap. Like, he took me upstairs and he had, I am not kidding you guys, at least 200 scroll saws. Some of them motorized, a lot of them treadle, a lot of them tiny little treadle ones. Like, I'm talking like hmm. little dinky guys, like have to be for like jewelers or something. I don't know what they're for. Oh, yeah. Um, But he had all this stuff, some treadle lathes up there. But then he had like four racks, like pallet racking full of turnings just stacked top to bottom and then he had racks full of scroll saw work like you know little kind of like the the craft fair type scroll saw work where it's you know a, sure. a pointing english pointer or you know whatever but then he had some crazy things i'm gonna have to go back out to this guy's place and take some pictures there because he had these big chandeliers that i'm not kidding were five foot tall had to have been four foot in diameter and like the amount of they were all scroll sawed. I was like, "What? The, like, who has the time for that?" <laughs> um, but I guess this guy uh, Rick, um, he had Mer Meredith must have done a line of products where they're doing scroll saw and ornaments for a number of years, mm -hmm. um, and he said he was the one that was doing all of them. So he's like, there were days he would he would scroll saw two hundred ornaments to fulfill orders. Oh, dude. Um, wow. Yeah, like like crazy. It just made me think how much I have no desire to do that. Just looking at all of this <laughs> stuff. Like, it's cool. And and this is where, like, I don't mind, like, any of these other things. Like, intarsia, carving, scroll sword. I don't mind. Like, hey, if you have the patience for that, fantastic. And I can appreciate the level that people are doing this at. No desire. Mm -hmm. No desire. Um, I did. I did couple months ago buy a scroll saw i bought a, a vintage delta that somebody had restored um because i would like to do some inlay marquetry type work okay um i have no desire to make a little pierced facade for a clock nope nope leave that to other people <laughs> yeah now so the I, moral I, of the story is that all of us have our intarsia <laughs> yes, we all have our own form of intarsia. Mine just happens to be intarsia. <laughs> intarsia. <laughs> uh, I know, and I know full well. I'm a very, I am very self aware that my own opinions are my own, and there are people that have the same opinions about the stuff I do. I know there are people that think the same thing about turning, and that's what I live for. Like right. I completely understand it, so it's not throwing shade at all. And I know Phil's not throwing shade at the Intarsia folk, maybe a little bit, but like, I just, man, the, yeah, 
I could see I, I I do appreciate the fact that people that maybe have a bad back because there's a lot of guys that mm. that get out of turning because they have bad backs and they can't right. bend over a lathe. Yeah. Scroll saw is perfect for somebody like that. They can sit there, you know. Um, I just mm, mm, nope. Not today, now, Satan. If it's just something about the scroll saw, it's just like a tool that I've never really mastered. It seems like it's just like I'm always fiddling with it and like can't get the blade on right and taking it on and off to get it. Yeah. I don't know. It's just like, I don't want to mess with it. Yeah. I yeah. I do think that that's one of those places where the higher end tools are just like exponentially better than right. the lower end tools. Like, I don't think you can, I don't think you can really like compare a Menards Dremel brand scroll saw <laughs> to a, you know, whatever the high end RBIs or whatever they are. Yeah. You know, Mm-hmm. that's fair i think it's also one of those things where um where there's a difference between being able to do something and being able to do something well oh you yeah know, like, 100 you know, like, 100 yeah you know and we've we've seen that and talked about it where you know there's a lot of woodworking that it's going to take a while before you're good at it because you just need practice on it, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, sharpening or turning or scroll saw work or something like that, or carving, you know, where you're going to have to get through the, get through the rough middle, so to speak, you know, like you can do something initially and your first things are like, Holy crap, I did that. And then you get going again and you're like, I'm not putting my name on that. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. And I definitely had some of those with turning where it was like, Oh, hey, this this bowl turned out really good. And then I was like, man, that was easy. I'm going to whip out another one quick. Seven hours later, I'm like, this is stupid. I'm never <laughs> yeah. doing this again. I, I, have I think that I'm with... just... No, I was saying I had uh, one of the carved bowls that I did, I gave to my parents for Christmas. And we were there this past Christmas. So it was like four or five years ago that I did this one and gave it to them. And I was at their house and was like looking at stuff. And then I saw it from across the room and I'm like, what's that weirdo thing on the show? Oh, it's that bowl. Ooh. Yeah. They're like, yeah. What thanks. If, and then they what if I the throw fridge. this in the smoker? Like, yeah. <laughs> you can just yeah. carve it some more. <laughs> yeah. That's right. It's like, I'm taking that's this kind, back. I'm going to recarve That's it. kind of what it needs. Yeah. It needs a second yeah. stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's, I'm, I'm, I think I'm just now kind of at the point where I can with 95% confidence turn something. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to walk to the lathe and have a disaster. Like, if you say, hey, make me a bowl in under 10 minutes, I can do that. Like, and I can do it pretty well 95% of the time. You know, that's pending something doesn't happen. Um, Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because to a certain extent. Well, here's a question then for you. Because I know that you've had some uh, white oak pieces around here. Yeah. That you had kind of roughed out into bowl blanks. And I know that you go into it with a with a form in mind. But how much does that change as you start turning and you figure out, you know, a little bit of what what's really going on inside the wood? Oh, um, those are pretty homogenous. So not a lot. Okay. Like, I would say, like, it's funny because those bowls are actually all sitting upstairs in my cabinet because I've actually been using them, like those little ones. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Like, I, I've, I'm at the point now where I get more enjoyment out of using that type of stuff that I make than just putting it on the shelf. So um, it, it's funny because they all nest together so nicely because they all started at roughly the same size and I know okay. what I'm going for. Right. But, like... If it's like a hollow form, that's a hollow form is, I think, a better example. Okay. It's like, I can kind of tell you the shape I'm going for, but if I pick up a good cut, I'm going to take that cut all the way down. As long as the shape's good and it's clean cut, I'm going to leave it. And it might be what I was going for. It might not. Um, I have experimented with some shapes. I'm, I'm looking up at my shelf right now where I have a couple of, I don't know, two, four, six, eight bowls sitting up there that I have roughed out at some point, And the shapes just aren't good. Um, 
And that's fine. And I think that's part of the process that we go through with some of these things where it's like you're discovering, you're discovering how to get to a good shape. And to me, that's what sets a good turner apart from a somebody that can turn is a good turner always has a good shape a good form if the shape's wrong it's just gonna feel clunky there's no two ways about it Um, right so and that's what i noticed at the when i doing judging at the iowa state fair is there are usually quite a few turning entries and you can really see there's a difference. Maybe this speaks to what we were talking about earlier too, is how skill and an artistic eye play or interact so much in turning more than maybe other pieces. Yeah. You know, cause I, there were some pieces that were very well executed technically, but just didn't look right for whatever reason. Yes. yes. And that's, and that I think, I think you just said it. I mean, that is more evident in turning than any other, I think, type of woodworking. Maybe carving. I mean, maybe carving, you could say that as well. Um, yeah. But like in turning, for sure, if you technically you can do everything correct, but if the shape is wrong and the form, you. In turning, you have to appease two senses. You have to appease the eye and your hands because, sure, you know, it needs to be smooth and it needs to look right. And if it doesn't, if it's missing one of those things, it's a fail. Yeah. It's a fail from a well-produced piece standpoint. It might still work for holding your popcorn. That's cool. Sure. So then is it really a failure? Yeah. And I guess that's, you know, you have to look at it as a sliding scale that... Mm-hmm you're always learning something and it doesn't take away from a practical value of it. Or maybe it just reveals like, this is where I am today as a turner or a woodworker. And this is what I was able to do. And the next one is probably going to be better or in a different way or something like that. Yeah. I think another good example of that is box makers, guys that do boxes if you look at some of Matt Canny's boxes, I mean, all of Matt Canny's boxes, they're, they're well, I mean, they're, they're done well. They're, they look good. They look right. Proportions are right. Then you look at a box that I made and I'm, you're like, Hmm, that's fat. Like, <laughs> like that's, that's not good. I mean, it's, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that's when, when you start looking at woodworking as a whole. Freeze frame. The P Yeah. <laughs> The people that really stand out as being, you know, you look at some of the, you know, Sam Maloof or Nakashima or, you know, name any one of them. They were as much artists or they have an artist's eye as well as a woodworker's ability. Sure. So, you know, I think that's where people really stand out. Yeah. And it's really easy to focus on one or the other. Oh yeah, completely. Blending Without... them together correctly is the hard part. Yeah. But... So to flip this, John, mm-hmm. considering your time here at Woodsmith and Shop Notes, since when you started, do you ever look back at projects that you designed early on? And are, do you have some definite wins back then? Or do you see a progress in how you've done stuff? I definitely have seen He wants seen to know if you have I the think fails. A, yeah. No. No, I think that all, like, looking back at any of my woodworking, it's like seeing, you know, differences, like, in progression. There are definitely projects from back in the day that I, you know, am pretty proud of. And then there's some that are like, what was I even thinking? That's like that's like high school shop class. How did how did they let me stay here? You know, do they just feel bad? Were they getting tax breaks to employ me? Like I don't know. So, 
But yeah, I mean, there's definitely stuff that I look back on and it's like, you know what? I could do a lot better today. But yeah. Yeah. So I think or that's maybe that you thing. would just take a different approach to it or something, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because I yeah, know that definitely. there are articles that I go back and that's like, I know that I wrote that, but that one was a dog. Yeah. And... Mm-hmm. Yep, definitely. I've done that with some of the technique articles or tool articles, you know, from when I first started. And I think just because of the nature of my role is I have to crank out a lot of articles. That's what I need to do. And those articles are going to reflect both my experience or lack of experience, you know, or the purpose or the point of a given article <clears throat> and coming to grips with that, but also knowing that, you know, just had to get some stuff out and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the way I would do it today would be totally different. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. On that same note, I feel the same way of some of the stuff I do now where it's like, I feel like, you know, I got to get stuff out. So it's like not really what I, you know, wanted as a completed project, but then it comes out of the shop and it's like, Whoa, that was really good. Or, like maybe stuff that I I'm not happy with, and then everybody else is really complimentary of like how it turned out, and that's when I'm like, oh, everybody just feels bad for me. <laughs> 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 but no, usually it's like the shop guys do such an amazing job of building any of the stuff I you know put through there, and so yeah, turns out really well. No, I went through a long period where I felt like I was the Rudy of the team, just. I just made the team out of sheer grit and I'll never play a down, but yeah. till the game's well in hand, <laughs> but yeah. All right. Yeah. Any final thoughts? No, I, I wanted to see if you guys are ever woodworking curious with the stuff. Like, like if you guys, <laughs> I don't want to go, go down this rabbit hole because I know you, you guys probably want to get home. <sighs> this stems from the videos we shot last week. Okay. Or that I oh, shot yeah, last yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, has there ever been, like, a furniture style or a technique that you guys have been woodworking curious about? And you weren't really sure if you wanted to try it, but when you tried it, you're like, okay, that was kind of fun, kind of cool. Yeah. Maybe I want to try it a little bit more. Like, yeah. not saying Phil needs to jump into our in Tarja or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, there's a lot of things that, like, especially watching somebody that's really talented do something that I would have not have thought of. It's like, oh, I would, you know, try that or whatever. But yeah, yeah, there's stuff like outside the box that I would definitely try. Yeah. I think that's why I dabble in carving on some of the things yeah. that I've done. That part of it. Uh, I, carving curious. Carving curious. I'm probably more c- curious in carving. Uh, there's been a few things that I've turned mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. since we, you know, I did those tool handles, and that's kind of fun to do. Yep. And I, I can see the appeal of it, and watching you, especially some of those little bowls that you were doing. Yep. Those are that's mm-hmm. kind of a fun form that I could see would be yep. would be cool. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I I definitely see that. So what you're referring to is we had lumberjack lumberjack tools here yep. that have like the, the tools to make log furniture. And yeah, it was like rustic like, style furniture. Yeah. So yep. I like having those tools here, like it was very cool to see how they work and like especially for for you, you have access to all these little tiny trees and logs yeah. and stuff in your backyard. And it's like, yeah, go knock down a few trees and put some tenons and yeah. mortises on them with these tools and slap together some furniture or some fence posts or some railings really quickly. And yeah, be fun. Yeah. Those, I, those some I really guess, fun tools. So I guess that's where I was like going with that. It's just like, you know, I'm an, I'm an avid outdoorsman. So like you go mm-hmm. to a cabin up North fishing or you walk into Cabela's or Bass Pro, you see this type of furniture, right? It's like the stripped down pine logs all tenoned and mortised together into a rustic bed or a couch or a chair or a table mm-hmm. or whatever. Like 
it's cool and I, I like that aesthetic. I don't like that aesthetic in my house, which is why I've never really been interested in it. Um, but yeah, having Mark and Shelly come down, the owners of Lumberjack Tools, bring their tools and we we're doing some videos. Um, so those videos will hit popular woodworkings YouTube um, probably sometime next month. Uh, I'm like, that was kind of fun. And the reason it was kind of fun is because it's kind of free form. You don't really, like, have any dimensions you're going off of. You're like, okay, I got this idea. This is how I'm going to stick these logs together. Mm -hmm. um, right. I mean, they have, you know, one of their kits does have a, like, uh, if you buy one of the kits of the cutters, so it has a bunch of different tenon maker sizes, um, you get, like, a plans book that has, 20, I think, 20 plans in it. So, like, it gives you some, like, rough ideas. But it's, like, it's kind of like my, like, my version of Neanderthal woodworking, but that's not the right term. It's like, right. you know, cut the log to length, strip the bark off, and put a tenon on the end, and then you're yeah. ready to go. Um, and we, you know, John, when, when you were here, when we were doing the videos, we were putting a couple, we were showing their fence-making system to do, like, post and, post and rail fences. Um, it's kind of interesting. I kind of see having some fun with that. Now, it's not going to be stuff I'm going to stick in my house, but... You know, Phil kept joking about me making a log swing. I, mean, I could see that. Like, that <laughs> might be kind of fun. You know? Uh, especially, like, if you get something that's fun, like the cedar that we were messing around with. Or um, mm -hmm. if you had a bunch of pines, like, if you lived next to a Christmas tree farm like I do. Right. You know? Like, that'd be kind of fun. Like, I could mm -hmm. I could get down with it. You could poach some Christmas trees? <laughs> I could go poach in some Christmas trees. Take off my blaze orange and run through the woods with the axe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I worked at a summer camp during college for three summers, and they had several of those kind of A-frame yeah. swings, you know, a two-person swing that was joined with that same kind of material. They were never empty. There yeah, was always exactly. people on it. Even if it was like the second to fourth grade camper, you know, kids that were there, yeah. there, there was always people sitting on them. So there, yeah. it's a... It's a legit thing. I'm going to bring in a book, Logan, for you to look at. Okay. Remember a few years ago, I went out to Wyoming and did a yeah. presentation for a group called By Western Hands. And they were, it was inspired by a guy who developed a style. His name is Thomas Molesworth. And I have a book of his furniture. And it's kind of that style, but it's a little bit more, well, it's a lot bit more refined. So that it has, yeah. it still has that look to it, but it was with a designer's eye so that you can definitely go from, yeah. look, I have two pieces of whatever and I've turned it into a footstool to here's a really cool, you know, set of like end tables or cabinets and stuff like that. So, well, let's see that. That's what I was going to say is like, how many, la how, you know, how deep are the layers on this? Is it all like, you know, Minnesota, I don't think Mark and Shelley like me saying Minnesota because they're from Wisconsin, mm -hmm. but that's where I go fishing. <laughs> so like right. I go to Minnesota to go yeah. fishing. So it's like, you know, is it all Minnesota cabin level or is there like, is there like bougie Boulder, Colorado level? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you there know? definitely is. Yeah. There's Jackson. So that would be level. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Jackson> <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It's just interesting. It just, I was, I was log furniture curious mm -hmm. before. Right. And this did nothing to put that fire out. So, <laughs> especially since we still have the tooling here. Yeah. Yes. So uh, there may be some, there may be some log furniture in the future. Yeah. Plus, they had the stake sharpening tool and then yeah. the fence post sharpening, like to make. <laughs> it's like you know what we could make some really cool siege, you know, weapons and yeah. medieval like. <laughs> vampire killer type stuff especially when you one know. of our camera guys asked if you were making grand i thought that yeah. was <laughs> that was pretty ideal it's like yeah you know, we could storm a castle here or something yep yep so yeah. i i mean i have to say and these these staking tools are basically think of a pencil sharpener like an old school stick the pencil in and spin it pencil sharpener not like a you know, hand crank one yeah that's basically what these are but they're attached either to a drill or Mark brought down a coupler that, that attaches it to a electric motor. So yes. we we mounted this electric motor to a sheet of plywood, attached it to the bench, 
turned it on. And then you basically just grab your stake blank, which is like a two by two by, I don't know, 18 inch long piece of whatever. Yeah. And you shove it into this spinning, you know, whirling, you know, carrot peeler. And it, it looked scary when we turned it on, but I made about 42 more than I needed to, <laughs> you know, because it was just like, meow, meow. it was, it was a blast. I had a lot of fun last week. Yeah. And for legal reasons, for legal reasons, no one's recommending hooking this up to a power takeoff. Just putting (laughs) it out there. But we're not recommending that. that. Those ideas were not bandied about at all. Yeah. So. Nope. Yeah. So. Okay. If you have a 52 horsepower tractor with a PTO. Yeah. There's a pencil sharpener for you. Right. All right, there's our discussion question for today. What are you woodworking curious about if it's not something in your normal wheelhouse of projects that you kind of do? Um, woodworking is a pretty big tent, and there's a lot of different corners to explore on it. So I'd like to hear about it in the comment section on our YouTube channel, or you can send us an email, woodsmith at woodsmith.com. The project free plans that go with today's episode are a set of layout gauges. These are pencil gauges that are made out of little offcuts of wood and some brass bar stock and are pretty handy for laying out lines along the edge, following corners and curves and things like that. Um, It's a tool that you didn't know you needed until you made it. So you can check out the plans for that on our YouTube channel and also on our show notes page over at shopnotes.com slash podcasts. Special thanks to Tight Bond for sponsoring today's episode. They're the glue we use here all the time, and I've rediscovered my love for hide glue over the last couple of projects that I've been working on. So find out what's the right glue for you. You can check that out at tightbond.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye.